All right, we are starting up. So I will say it again since I started without uh, hitting the record button. Every Christian failure is a prayer failure in some way, shape, or form. Either hearing from God in the beginning or getting the Holy Spirit's direction on how to go about that particular path. At some point, it is a prayer failure. So let's start in prayer, shall we? All right. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you. You are an awesome, holy, worthy, and mighty God. We love you, Lord. Thank you that we can freely come together uh, without persecution like they do in so many countries. They have, to, they have to sneak these Bible study meetings in so many countries, Lord. We thank you that we live in a free country. We thank you that we can come together freely and openly and study your word. Lord, we thank you. Lord, for the freedom that we have. We thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy, your protection. Lord, and we pray and invite your Holy Spirit to move here tonight, not by my will, not by my mental direction, but Lord, by your Holy Spirit. We pray your Holy Spirit would be the teacher, the counselor in this meeting. We pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would show us things that we haven't seen, including me. Things I don't have in my notes. Things I haven't thought of. Your word says we have the mind of Christ. So we pray that that mind would do the teaching for us tonight as a group. And we pray we don't leave these doors tonight the same as we came in. We pray this is a turning point. We pray you would give us tools for breakthroughs. Lord, help us. Help me. Guide us into your truth into your revelation, into your knowledge, by your word and your spirit and nothing else. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. Lord, I love these people. I pray that your Holy Spirit would change lives tonight and that they would be blessed and never be the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. You guys ready to have some fun tonight? Yeah. All right. I haven't taught in a while. If you've heard me uh, teach before, this is going to be a little bit different, um, but I am definitely going to endeavor to be Holy Spirit led. If it takes me off my notes, then it takes me off my notes. That's okay. Um, I want to make sure the Holy Spirit's doing the teaching and not me. Okay. Um, I want to start with this, and this is big. We're going we're gonna to do a few big foundational points. We're going to build a building tonight. So we got to get the foundation right. You know, build the foundation right. What happens to the house? Falls. Yeah, falls apart, right? Okay, so number one, if you are not using your faith on something impossible, then you aren't using your faith at all. I'm going to say that again. If you are not using your faith on something that is impossible, on your own strength, then you aren't using your faith at all. You're just doing what you know you can do on your own strength. Okay? So if you're endeavoring to do something big and you got the plan for it, you got your strategy, you got your outline, and you're pretty confident you got this. And I'll be honest, there's a lot of things that I've tackled where I felt like, well, I got this. Maybe I prayed about it anyway. But inside, I was thinking, I, I can do this. I can do, I'm going to pray because I know to pray, but I can do this. That's not really using the God kind of faith that's outlined in Mark 11. Okay? It, the literal translation that we're going to get to is that you have the God kind of faith. It's made out of the same stuff. It's like made out of the same material. Okay? Your faith was given to you by God. It's not like he's got one form of faith and you have another kind, right? It's not like comparing denim or jeans material to corduroy. Those are different materials, right? So you have the God kind of faith, but if you're not using it on something that you know you can't do on your own strength, you're not shooting at 100%. You're not really using the God kind of faith. You're using mental acuity. You're using your gifts, your God-given gifts often. 
you're not really using something that is supernatural. Because if you want to go into that realm, it can't be possible on your strength. It's got to be too big for you. Okay? I've had some huge breakthroughs lately that I'll get to later, maybe even next week. But the they are definitely impossible. There's no way I could be doing the stuff I'm doing right now on my own strength. I don't have enough education in uh, economics. I don't have enough education in uh, specifics. I don't have the I don't have the connections to do what I'm doing right now on my own strength. I knew it was impossible, and that's kind of why I shot where I shot. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I knew I was heading for something I couldn't do on Sean's strength alone or Sean's ability alone. Okay. Okay. Now, um, I want to get into seed time and harvest here. Okay. Because this is a master principle that you're not going to be able to achieve your hundred percent. Right. And I'm saying, when I say your hundred percent, I'm assuming you all know, like your hundred percent means God is added to you right? For you to achieve your 100%, like for Oral Roberts, Roberts preaching, it was 40 million souls saved. That was his 100% with God. I don't know what your 100% is, but you and God will have an idea of what your 100% is, okay? All right. When you eat an apple, do you eat the seed? No. no. Okay. Josh, when you eat a peach, do you eat the peach pit? No. Okay. Micah, my daughter, likes to make guacamole, and she's quite good at it, actually. How about avocados? Like, if you eat the avocado pit, that big pit in the center, or do you just get the good green stuff? Yeah, you get the good green stuff. Okay. So, why not? Why don't you eat the seed? Why don't you eat the avocado seed? Why not the peach pit? Why not apple seeds? Why aren't you looking for seeds to eat? Yeah, they don't taste good. They're not designed for good eating, are they? No. If you cut up an avocado seed, it's still going to taste bitter and you're probably going to break your teeth on it, right? That sucker's hard. We know instinctually I'm not going to eat the avocado pit or the peach pit or any type of seed like that. A, it doesn't smell good. It doesn't look inviting like, you know, a fruit does. There's nothing about it that says, oh, I want to eat that. Right? Okay. You don't eat your seed. You plant your seed. Right? Okay. Why? So you get more fruit. That's all tithing and offerings are. It's your seed. Okay, if you eat your seed, you can't get a harvest. You have to actually plan to seed. You have to plant it. You have to cover it. You have to water it. You got to make sure it's in a part of the yard that gets good sun, right? My wife's really great at growing tomatoes on the deck. She grows these things and they taste like fantastic, by the way. And like way better than anything that you get because of all the stuff they do with it. There's all kinds of stuff. I don't want to gross you guys out, but there's all kinds of stuff they've been doing with tomatoes. They cross them with the genetics of a fly so that they last longer on the shelf and they're uh, harder, riper, tougher. Okay. They do all kinds of stuff like this. Why? Because they want, it to, they want you to buy it. They want it to look good. They don't want it to rot too quickly and get mildew. <laughs> the look she's got on her face. She's like, they do what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they do all. And guess what? They started this a long time ago. First time I actually heard about it, I was in college. It was at Stanford. And it was like, I mean, they were doing this in the 90s. They were already doing stuff like this. So you've been eating it for a long time. But when you grow it on your back deck and it's just organic, right? Um, it tastes really good. But Teresa's got to put it, she's got a spot. She's got a spot on the back deck. It's like, that gets a lot of light. And I know how much to water it. And I know, you know, and she takes care of it. And she puts stuff around so the squirrels don't get it. And all this kind of stuff. So you have to protect seed. Okay? So, again, you don't eat your seed. You plant it. All right? Um, you protect it. You make sure it doesn't get dug up by little squirrels and animals who want to eat your stuff. Okay? 
So when you tithe and give offerings, why aren't you doing the same thing? What are you doing to protect your seed? Why aren't you always getting a hundredfold return? I mean, Jesus said you have a hundredfold return. Why aren't you getting it? We're going to talk about that. We're going to go to that scripture. We're going to analyze that. We're going to get very hands-on. This is not going to be all theoretical teaching. This is going to be a lot of hands-on stuff. Okay? All right. Um, you must plant and you must harvest. Both of those jobs are yours. And the in-between part, too, of protecting the seed, that's your job, too. It's all your job. You have all the ability. You have the law of seed time and harvest. You have all that going for you, but you still have to do work that's involved with that harvest. Okay. Now, what I want to do is, whoop, let's drop the page. I want to go over here and I want to study with you guys right now the law of seed time and harvest. Okay. Give me one second. I'm going to go through and get my notes here. Okay, actually, let me back up a little bit. Before we get to that, I want to paint a really clear picture here. There's theoretical science, you guys have probably heard about this, versus applied science. Has anybody ever heard, like, seen that? Theory science, theoretical physics versus applied physics. So here it is in a nutshell. Theoretical physics are theories on how stuff work and uh, stuff works in the whole world and uh, they're not always provable sometimes they're just theories sometimes they are provable through applied science so you take the theory you apply it and you prove empirically it's true it's real and it works um, i'll give you a short famous example einstein's theory of relativity e equals mc squared right that's e energy equals m mass times c a constant which is the speed of light, 186,200 miles a second, okay? Uh, squared. By the way, have you ever taken that number, 186,000, I just thought 186,200 and square it? It's like, I is that 37 billion plus? I'm doing some rough math in my head. It's a giant number. So here's an example of applied science. When they built the atomic bomb, it was called the Manhattan Project. They looked at Einstein's theory and thought, you know what? That's an awful lot of energy being released on that side of the equation, E, for energy. So if we can take unstable mass, uranium, plutonium, something that's easily blown up, maybe we can release literally billions and billions of units of energy per second. And that's what an atomic bomb is. It is a massive amount of energy released immediately, okay? All right, so I don't want to just talk about Bible theory today and next week. I want to talk about how to use it like applied science, how to take the theory and put it into action, all right? Um, how to, let's say, uh, biblically reap. All right, so we have a law of seed time and harvest. It's a law. It's a law that works like gravity. It's the same type of law that causes uh, physical things to function like theoretical physics, applied physics, and so forth, okay? These are laws. The law of gravity is holding you in your seat right now, okay? God's laws, his spiritual laws, work just like that, just on a plane that we can't always see with our eyes. But with seed time and harvest, you actually can see it. You can plant a seed, right? You can plant a tomato seed and get a tomato harvest, right? And actually, a hundredfold return is not that big in nature. When you plant a tomato seed, you'll probably get a tomato bush that will yield, I think it's the average of 500 to 1,000 seeds that come from the seed. So in nature, having a multiplied return is not that big a deal. It's normal. We expect it, right? We completely expect it. If you planted a, a tomato seed and you only got one seed as a result or two, you'd be like, something's wrong with that seed. Like <laughs> something, somebody messed with that. That's not the way these work. You plant some tomato seeds, they yield a whole bunch of tomatoes with a whole bunch more seeds in them and, and so on and so on, right? Okay. All right. So I want us to focus on the law of seed time and harvest. Let's go to Genesis 8, 22. I'm going to turn there. If you have Bibles, go ahead and turn. 
Genesis eight twenty two. All right, Genesis 8, 22. If you're not there, it's okay. I'll just go ahead and read. This is God speaking. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So as long as the earth is here, these things are not going to change. Number one is what? Seed time and harvest. Number two, cold and heat. Listen, you may not like the summer. It's hot right now. It's hot in here. But guess what? Summer's still coming. <laughs> it's still going to be warm every summer. And it's still going to be cold this coming winter. And it doesn't matter if you like it or don't like it. That's what's coming, right? You can love winter, hate winter. You can love summer or hate summer. It doesn't matter. Winter and summer are not going away. It's in the word. It's not going to change as long as this earth is here until... You know, Jesus returns and the whole thing's remade. You can count on seasons, okay? Uh, day and night. You know what I used to do if I was up against something really big? And I was like, oh boy, man, I got to do well on this. I got to have this meeting go well. Or I got to have this thing go well. I'd always remind myself, you know, the sun's still going to rise in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's still going to rise. And, and guess what? Night's going to fall. Night's going to fall again. I'm going to have it tomorrow night. So if things don't go well tomorrow in the afternoon, as well as I'd want, hey, the sun's still going to rise, still going to fall. It's not the end of the world. Um, and I would remind myself of that even before I was a Christian, just from reading the Old Testament, just from growing up Jewish. I'd be like, eh, still going to still gonna be day, still going to be night. All right. So um, it is important that we understand that seed time and harvest is a law. Everything in the world comes from a seed. You came from a seed. Everybody here came from a seed. Every single uh, plant, you can call it pollen or whatever you want, but it's a seed, right? Everything comes from a seed. Every animal, I don't care if it's mammals, fish, whatever, everything comes from a seed. Even, I could even take that further and go, uh, this building came from a seed. What was the seed? Well, the seed was a thought. We should have a building there. Well, how big should it be? Well, I don't know. Let's, let's do some dimensions here. We'll walk it out and get a foundation. There were thought seeds Someone had a vision for it. Some architect drew it. The plans got through, you know, the permit stage. And the contractor had to look at it and go, I got to take these plans, somebody's thought, and I have to see it myself and then create it physically. Everything's from the sea. Everything. Okay? All right. Now, um, ooh, before I get to that, I want to I wanna jump on something else. Um... Some seeds are tougher than others. Have you ever been driving out of town and you see like a tree growing out of the side of the mountain and it's like completely covered in rock except for like one spot between two rocks and it was like just barely this little hole and like the seed took root and now there's a tree sticking out of it and it, and it really when you first look at it, it just looks like it's growing out of rock. Right over on China Island there's some of these you know in that area. It just looks like somehow that seed took hold in the tiniest of spots and was able to grow. Um, that is an example of a tough seed. That seed got in there, found a little bit of soil, those roots got in there and somehow found enough dirt to worm its way into and actually grow a tree out of it. That's a tough seed. Some seeds are tougher than others. Uh, we'll come back to that later, but make a mental note of that. Some seeds are tougher than others. Some seeds need to be protected more than others. Some seeds need a little more love and a little more care. Others, they just kind of grow. They're just tough, like weeds. Weeds in your backyard. You ever notice you don't have to water weeds? And yet they still come. How is that? It doesn't, I mean, like, they seem to like suck moisture out of the air. Or if it rains in Big Bear like once every week in the summer, they're like, that's good, I got it. No, I, I have enough water to take over your yard. I'm good, right? <laughs> they're just tougher, but they're not always good. And that's what I've noticed. Some of the toughest seeds come out of uh, sin and anger and unrighteousness. And, but they, once they get a root, man, they don't need much fuel. They don't really need to be fed much. They take root. And just like weeds in your, in your garden, like you have to forcibly rip them out. You have to take energy. You got to get on the gloves or get some clippers, and if you pull them out and you don't get the whole root, if you just get the top, guess what? It's coming back. Yeah. 
right? Those usually aren't the type of seeds that you want in your life's garden. They need the smallest amount of water and sun and moisture, and yet they grow like crazy. So just remember, the domesticated grass, the good stuff, that takes some work. Mow it, and fertilize it, and protect it, and you know, watch out for you know, ground squirrels ripping it up and all the rest. But weeds, man, not a lot of work to get them to grow. Okay, so just remember, there are different types of seeds, some good, some not so good. All right, and every seed produces after its own kind. This is important. You want tomatoes? You plant tomato seed. What if you want apples? What do you plant? Apple seed. Apple seed. Okay. So this isn't a big jump. When you want finances, you plant finances. If you want a car, you plant a car. Remember when we gave a car to reason? Okay, so we, we gave this. It was the best we could do at the time. It was a nice little Honda. It was older. wasn't brand new or fancy. And I was thinking about this. Ended up with a BMW X5. All paid for. So planted, even though we were thinking it would be a different harvest, every seed produces after its own kind. We actually were thinking at the time, because we were still young at this, uh, we plant a car and get a house, like plant a, uh, the seed of a car for a house. It doesn't work like that. We ended up with some really nice cars. However, if you want a house, I'll give you an example. Go help somebody build a house. That's a good seed zone, right? That's something you can do. You might not be able to like, buy them a whole house, but you could help them with theirs, right? That's a good seed zone, okay? Every seed produces after its own kind. If you want people to help you in your career, go help somebody in somebody else's career. I've noticed all kinds of, I spent quite a bit of time and energy, I was looking at you just now, Josh, helping you in your career and your stuff. I've been blessed by that. I've gotten multiplied returns in my career, specifically entertainment stuff, by sowing seed into your career, right? We've even gotten acting jobs just by actually just sowing into you. So that's interesting, isn't it? Every seed produces after its own kind. You ever notice the kids look like their parents? Do you ever look at Daphne and go, looks an awful lot like her parents? Mm -hmm. That's not a big surprise, mm -hmm. right? If you look at my kids, they look a lot like Teresa and I, don't they? Yeah. Well, guess what? That's true of everybody. Kids look like their parents. Why? Every seed produces after its own kind. Okay? So this is a law that applies all over the place. All right? Okay. Now, um, okay. I'm going to jump into some keys to reaping. All right? We're, there's going to be some more next week. There's going to be guidelines. I have keys and guidelines. I don't know why I broke them up like that. I just did. But that's what God gave me. So these are keys to reaping. And actually, you know what though? Before I get to that, we need to read our, I skipped a foundational scripture. Bad Sean. Bad Sean. Go back in the corner. All right, let's go to Mark. Before we get to those keys, we need to go to Mark. We need to actually, that was just my prelude. Now we're finally getting into the good stuff. Now we're getting into the meat now. It's just the warm up. Okay. We're going to focus on a couple here. Mark chapter 10 verse 29 and 30. Okay. This is a foundational scripture for the hundredfold return, although there are others. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and read. So Jesus answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one. Everybody say no one. No one. No one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands. Everybody say lands. lands. You know what that was significant of. That was the most expensive thing you could have at the time was land. You'd just be a property owner. It's not that much different now. Have you seen how expensive real estate has gotten? Yes. Even up here? Yeah. You guys know. <laughs> okay. Lands. Giving up lands, property, possessions. For my sake and the gospel's. Who shall not receive a hundredfold now. Say hundredfold now. A hundredfold now. Hundred now in this time. Houses. Oh, there it is. Houses. We're back to real estate. Jesus was a big real estate guy. He's often talking about real estate and money. No, seriously, over half the parables. They're either about real estate or money. 
go, go, that's a whole other study, but we could go check that out. That's a fun study. Who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands. There's real estate again. Isn't that interesting? Property, possessions, house, land. And notice, with persecutions. <laughs> Underline that in your Bible. With persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. So he just said, you're getting a hundredfold now for anything you give for Jesus and the gospel's sake. And afterward, everlasting life. That sounds like twofold treasure to me. That sounds like stuff's coming now and stuff's coming later. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we need to read it again? Maybe you guys need to hear it. I don't see a lot of head shaking. I see a few head shaking. Everybody getting it? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So there's two issues at hand here. First of all, I didn't write this. I want to make that clear. I wish this was the gospel according to Sean. I didn't make it in there. I was late to the party. This guy named Mark already recorded Jesus' words. This is not me. This is, and this is actually in several gospels. I'm just using uh, this one from Mark for now in the interest of time. So the key here is that Jesus said it. This is a principle straight out of Genesis, seed time and harvest. Again, you would think nothing about sowing a tomato seed and ending up with 500 to 1,000 tomato seeds as a, as a result of that whole bush growing up and being properly cultivated. But it seems to be hard for a lot of people to understand giving financially for the gospel's sake and being multiplied back. Okay? I've gotten a hundredfold return many times. What interests me is when I don't get quite a hundredfold. It, it, we're going to get to something here now. Actually, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's go back in Mark. We're going to go right back here to Mark 4. It's just a few pages back. Okay? It's Mark... 13, all right, I'm just going to start reading. This is a little bigger chunk. This is, this is often referred to as the mother of all parables. And I will tell you why. It's because Jesus, well, you'll see it. You'll see it for yourself. I don't have to explain it. You'll see it. And he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, it's in red. Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? That's why it's the mother of all parables. If you don't get this, you're not getting any parables. You are not going to understand anything Jesus was talking about at all. This is the key. I'm going to read that again. I'm even taking my glasses off. How then will you understand all the parables? So you have to, I wrote this in my Bible, you must look at all parables through this parable. If you're going to understand all parables, according to him, you can't understand any parables without understanding this parable. So look through parables through the eyes of this parable. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to keep going with that. The sower sows the word. Everybody say that. The sower sows the word. Sows the word. How do you sow a word into somebody? You tell them. It's Romans 4. You... Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You sow by speaking it out. How did God make the entire universe? He spoke it. He spoke it. Yes. Yeah. He had an inner image, according to Hebrews. I don't have time for that cross study. But basically, he knew what he was making before he made it. But he spoke it to make it. Do you think you're any different? Do you think your process is going to be any different than the guy, the almighty God who made you? Do you think you're going to get away with making anything big without imitating him? You're not. <laughs> you're not going to. People often say like, well, I have this thought and I'm doing it and I'm just, you know, I have it in my mind what I'm going to do. Well, speak it out. Talk about it. Talk about it getting done. Okay. The sower sows the word. I don't care if it's a word on healing. I don't care if it's the word on prosperity. I don't care if it's a word about salvation. It's how you got saved. You heard a word. You believed it. You spoke the words. I'm accepting Jesus. And guess what? Something changed in you. Right? Right? Yeah. I am dealing with believers here, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm making sure. If we haven't done that part, <laughs> the rest doesn't work. We've got to work backwards then. All right. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, 
Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stone, uh, sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Well, let me actually, before I get into the next one, Satan comes immediately to steal the word. Again, I want to do brass tacks metaphor here. So you hear the word on something like this about giving. And, and then a bill comes in you weren't expecting. Something breaks. You're like, why? In the, what? The dishwasher? Really? The dishwasher's been working great for 10 years. Why now? Well, remember, you have an enemy. And if I was your enemy and you got good news, I would do everything I could to convince you that's not good news. It doesn't apply to you. And I'm going to break some stuff just so you don't get too focused on that good news. Get you looking over here. Right? Why? I'm your enemy. That's what I would do to my enemy. We used to do it in football. There's a simple version of this. You get them looking over there with a sneak and then, you know, on the left and then you run to the right. It's not rocket science. It's a fake handoff. Oh, I got it. Okay. Everybody goes for the decoy. Meanwhile, I'm running up the field. There's nobody chasing me. Why? You fell for the decoy and I'm fast. <laughs> so you're not going to catch me now. Okay. All right. So that's. An example of Satan comes immediately to take away the word that was sown in their hearts. All right. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Remember the stony ground? I told you about the tree that somehow was able to grow. Remember that. We'll come back to it. Immediately receive it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves. And so endure only for a time afterward when number one, tribulation. Two, or persecution, arises for the word's sake. Immediately they stumble. Okay? So, I've noticed that bad seed, seed from bad stuff, stuff you don't want in your life, that doesn't need, that'll grow fine in stony ground. It's a weed. It's like it, you know, it'll grow anywhere. You're like, how's that weed growing out of the side of the mountain? But it is rare when you see a good tree that's somehow able to take that one little spot and grow into a strong tree that's seemingly sticking out of the side of a mountain that's basically all rock. You can't even see where the dirt is. Somehow it found dirt and water and sun and grew. Okay. But that's a good seed. Okay. This is good seed. Okay. But it was sown into stony ground. And as soon it had no root. It had no roots. You're talking about the heart hadn't been prepared. Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody and um, it's just, they're just not ready to hear it. It's you're like, no, Jesus is great. It made my life way better. Like I'd be in real trouble without Jesus. I'd be in real trouble without my faith. I would be lost. I'd be a bad guy. And they're just like, yeah, whatever. That's you. That's not me. I don't need it. Their heart is not prepared yet. The soil is not soft. You could plant good seed in that stony, awful ground all day long. It's not going to grow. I got a few parts in my yard. We put 10,000 square feet of grass in. And there's a couple spots. And I've never been able to get grass to grow more than a short time period in those spots. It's just lousy ground in those spots. Or maybe it doesn't have enough sun. But I know it's getting water. And I know it's good seed because I planted it. Right? And I can see the sprinklers watering the area, but the darn grass won't grow. Just a few spots. 98%, maybe 99%. Fantastic. But there's like 1%. I can't get it to grow. Bad ground. Okay. So you're going to run across that. Don't you be bad ground. Don't hear this word tonight and be stony ground because then it's not going to work for you. Okay. All right. They have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Tribulation, that's troubles, guys, or persecution. People just openly attacking you for believing what you believe, acting the way you act, doing what you do, just openly just don't like you. I have seen a lot of this. There was a time, how many jobs was I fired from, from like preaching the gospel? Like, there was a time in my 20s where I was just like, I was getting fired like it was my job to get fired. Like that was my job. Your job is to preach the gospel so aggressively, they fire you. Go. And I was, I was batting a thousand. I was just like getting fired every day. And finally, my pastor, <laughs> my pastor that we were in LA, he was like, Sean, you're, you're going to have to work for you. 
Because if you work for other people, you are probably going to get into trouble. <laughs> okay? So, and then he, I'm probably the only person he ever told. He was like, you, you have to find less of a Paul style and more of a Jesus style. Because otherwise, you're not going to be able to pay your rent. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you some funny stories. But anyway, all right. Uh, let's go to the next one. Now, these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. Okay, and by the way, this is the most common one. These are the ones among thorns. Okay, the, they are the ones who hear the word and the number one, cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Okay, if you're tithing and giving offerings and you're not seeing a good return back, something's wrong. Okay, um, in, in the word, it actually says, if you are sowing much and reaping little, consider your ways. You hear me? That means something you're doing is not cultivating the good seed you've sown and you're losing harvest. The squirrels are getting in. The rabbits are getting in. The enemy's getting in. He's munching on your harvest right now. Okay. So let's go over that list real quick. Again, cares of this. What, what scripture is that? Which one? Um, the one where you said. Uh, sowing mu if you're sowing much and reaping little, consider your ways. Um, I'll have to look it up. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I, I didn't. Uh, I don't have it on this note right here. I will look it up and I will tell it to you before we're done. Okay. Um, okay. But I don't want to miss this. This is important. These are the ones that. Uh, really get people cares of this world. Hey, I can tell you that's probably my biggest challenge. There are so many cares when you're the breadwinner in a family. If, if you're like me and you have a wife and two kids and you're the sole breadwinner, you have cares that you are going to have to roll over onto Jesus every day, every day. Those cares come on you. You got to say, no, 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 no. Jesus said, cast all your care on me. I'm going to cast my cares on him. I'm not going to take the care on myself. I'm rolling that care over. Okay, so cares of this world, they are um, always coming after you, uh, even at teenage level. I see this with you guys. So there's school and there's all these other influences, right? So it takes your focus away from God and onto whatever it is you're focused on, whether it's school or friends or social life or like whatever it is. So teenagers deal with this stuff too. It's just different. It's just the things tempting them to get their eyes off God are a little bit different than maybe a full-grown man who's providing for a family, right? But it's still the same thing, okay? It's the cares of this world. Number two, the deceitfulness of riches. Well, that's running after money for money's sake. You don't run after money for money's sake. I'm not talking about uh, working hard to get money. I'm actually talking about sowing into the kingdom and believing God for the harvest and I, I have noticed amazing returns. In fact, um, somebody remind me to come back to this. I've consistently noticed with tithing at least a tenfold return every year for years and years and years and years and years. Isn't that interesting? If you make $10,000 and you give $1,000 and God gives you a tenfold return, you're, you're back to the same 10, right? If you make $100,000 in a year and you tithe 10 and you notice the next year you made $100,000 again, that's tenfold. I've noticed this consistently just with tithing. I'm not even talking about offerings now because the offering is what you give above the tithe. The tithe is the Lord's. If you give a tithe, you're just giving him back what's his. As it says in Malachi, the tithe is the Lord's. You're actually just giving back what already belongs to him. If I hand you my keys and I ask for them back and you give them back to me, did you give me anything? No, they're my keys to my house, my cars and my stuff. You didn't give me anything. Daphne, if I give you the key to my car mm -hmm. and you give it back to me when I asked, did you really give me the car? No, you just gave me back the keys that I handed you. It's my keys, my car. You can't even drive. You're too young to drive. <laughs> so you didn't really give me anything. You just returned to me what was mine. That's all tithing is. You're just giving him back what's his and you watch. When you do it right, it's always at least a tenfold return. However, I've noticed increase. It usually, if I've done the math, it's more like 11 or 12 fold, but we'll come back to that later. When you give beyond your tithe, guys, that's your money. That's your offering. And that's the difference between a tithe and an offering. 
When you're going beyond your tithe, you're now into your money. It's not God's money. It's your money. The tithe is the Lord, the first 10%. And beyond that, that's yours. That's where the hundredfold comes in. And that's where I've seen it consistently. Okay? I've seen great provision and great blessing with tithing. Where I've seen the hundredfold return is when I've gone beyond my tithe. Okay. All right. We're going to come back to that. All right. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things. That one kind of covers everything, right? Desires for other things. Things is pretty broad, right? A thing is a thing. There's a list of, you know, almost infinite long of things, okay? So it's the desires for anything. Thing that you want. I don't, know, I don't care if it's fame, fortune, popularity. I don't care if it's uh, a car, uh, an RV, uh, whatever. If it takes more of your focus than your focus on Jesus and the word, then it's going to ultimately rob you of your own harvest. Mm -hmm. It's the old saying, whatever you compromise to keep, you will eventually lose. Okay, so that's really this in a nutshell. Okay, so desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So these things come in and they choke the word. I don't know if you've ever seen weeds growing around a healthy plant. Eventually the healthy plant dies and the weeds seem to do fine. Right? That's exactly what he's talking about here. They choke the word. And these are the ones sown on good ground. Oh, finally. All right. It, by the way. How many types of seed have we seen in this parable? Four. No, one. There's one type of seed. There's four types of ground. Mm -hmm. You decide the ground. You're the ground. The seed of the word of God is the seed of the word of God. It doesn't change. It works all the time. It is what it is. It does not change. But you do. You can prepare your heart differently. You can speak differently, act differently out of your own free will. Mm -hmm. You're the ground, guys. Right. So this fourth type, and by the way, this sower, this farmer, he's not batting very well. Mm -hmm. We're finally getting to good ground. He struck out three out of four times. Mm -hmm. We're finally getting to good ground here. Mm -hmm. He's batting 250 in this parable, right? That's not great. My kid batted 775 in high school. That's a good batting average. This sower, not so great. But guess what? When it gets a good seed and good ground, that's the hundredfold. Check it out. Jesus' words. These are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word. So you got to hear it. That's step one. Number two, accept it and bear fruit. Some 30 fold, some 60 and some 100. So good ground, prepared, receptive, good ground, believing heart. That's where you get the hundredfold. Now, here's what's interesting to me. Why does he say 30, 60, and 100? This bothers me. It doesn't seem to bother anybody. I don't see anybody else freaking out. They're like, listen, 30 be great. <laughs> I give a buck, I give 30 bucks back. Uh, it's good enough. I had a revelation on this. I think, I, I think actually you were there when I spoke on this years ago. It was the first portion of this revelation that I got. 30, 60, and 100 depends on you. 30% of the time you're focused on the word, acting in line with the word, 30-fold return. 60% of the time you're focused on the word, listening to the word, doing, being a doer of the word and not a hearer only, 60-fold return. 100% of the time, I mean, if you're like... I'm not watching TV. I'm not going, like, unless it's the word, I'm not watching. I am 100% focused. I need the hundredfold, so I am blocking everything else out. I am going to focus on God. I'm going to focus on the word. I'm going to focus on my harvest. I am going to be praying regularly. I'm going to be doing what I hear. If you're 100% focused, and you've seen 100% focused people, right? Mm -hmm. It's pretty intense to be around them, isn't it? You can't actually get around a person who's 100% focused on the word unless you get an agreement with them and are like that around them. Yes. Otherwise, it'll bother you. Like you'll leave and go do something else. Like I've had enough of that. I'm just a very intense person. I'm gonna take a break, <laughs> you know? Need a little breather, <laughs> okay? But guess what? That's the person getting a hundredfold return. When I've done that, I've gotten a hundredfold. I might've driven a few people crazy in the process, but I got a hundredfold, okay? So this depends on you. The promise is there. 
how focused you are on God, how focused you are on doing what he's called you to do, how focused you are on achieving what he's called you to do, that's going to determine your harvest. It is not automatic. Uh, I'm going to step on some toes here. What the heck? Why not? It's not the first time. <laughs> you guys all know what chutzpah is? Yep. <laughs> in Yiddish, it's, it's the courage to say the thing that nobody really wants to hear. To be the guy in the room, they're like, God, I wish that guy would shut up. <laughs> Saying things that are making me uncomfortable. Okay, so I'm going to have some chutzpah here. Is tithing, when you, when you write a check or you put money into uh, the, the basket when it goes around in church, is that tithing? Isn't that tithing? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes. Well, if it's 10% of your income, of your, actually, it's not 10% of your income. That's not accurate. People get this wrong all the time. It's 10% of your increase. If you get $1,000 on an investment that cost you 900 to make, you only made $100. Bible says you are to tithe on your increase. You guys understand that? No. no. Okay. Let's say uh, you own a house. And that house cost you $900 per month in mortgage. So you rent it out and the renters pay you $1,000 per month. How much money did you actually make net? $100. Made $100, right? It cost you $900 for the mortgage. They paid you $1,000. $1,000 minus $900 is $100. You made $100. So your tithe on that would be $10. You understand? It's your increase. Otherwise, let's say, let's say something, say an investment's costing you $50,000 a year to run and you're only making 51,000. You made $1,000 a year. That's what you make. So you tithe on that. Does that make sense? Can you make it a little more simple? Let's say I make $500 a week for my salary. Uh-huh. Okay. So if you're making a salary, then you, you do tithe on the salary that comes in. But what I'm saying is, if in order to make that salary, okay, we'll take, take real estate, for example. If somebody's making $10,000 a month, but they're spending $2,000 a month on advertising, they only made $8,000 net, okay? So what you're saying is, and I can explain it more to you later if you'd like, but it's your increase that you tithe on, okay? That's what you need to understand. All right. So um, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> How focused you are on God determines your return. Yeah. The actual act, thank you, just reminded me. So, the money you put into the basket is the tithe. What is tithing? Tithing is not the tithe. They're not the same thing. Okay? All right. I'm going to do this again. So, you have a tithe of, let's say, $10. You're going to put that $10 in. The $10 is the tithe. It has no power in it. It's like a seed. You ever seen a sunflower seed? You know, the guys, when you're playing baseball, you crack them open, you eat the inside, and you spit out the shell. Okay, the money is like the shell. It's the faith you put inside the seed from you, your God kind of faith, that gives it life. A $10 bill is nothing. It's a piece of paper that was made, 50% of it is recycled jeans. That's how they make dollar bills now. Okay, it's most of it's recycled clothings and linens that they printed something on and decided we're going to give it this denomination and value. It's not even backed by gold. It's backed by nothing other than good faith. What we have actually in this country and in most is called fiat currency. You know what fiat currency means? It means it's backed by nothing other than we think it's worth this. It's a made up number. <laughs> you know, the, the paper that a $100 bill is printed on is worth no more than the paper printed a $1 bill. It's the same paper. It's just recycled stuff, okay? But somebody decided we're going to make X number of hundreds and X number of ones, and we're going to give it that denomination. And in the United States, this is legal tender. It actually says this is legal tender. If you give somebody that bill and they won't receive it, legally your bill is paid because it's legal tender and you offered it. Do you understand? If they go, well, I don't think it's worth $100. Well, I don't care. It says so on it. It's legal tender. I offered it to you. If you don't take it, my bill is still paid. That's the law. Okay. So, 
Uh, let me come back to the important stuff here. I'm getting, I'm getting sidetracked. All right. The actual act of tithing is worshiping God with your tithe. That's good. I don't care if it's money or a goat. I don't care what you're giving. If you're just plopping money in a bucket, you're throwing your money away and don't expect a harvest. You're just the guy in Jesus' parable taking seed and going, maybe it'll, maybe it'll grow. I'll just throw it out over here. Hopefully there's some good ground over there. I'm just going to throw it out there. Let's see what happens. You know what's going to happen? The birds are going to eat it and have a field day with it. And maybe, maybe you'll get lucky and one of those seeds will stick in some pretty good ground and you'll get a little harvest. Maybe. All right. You know how tough it is to get stuff to grow in Big Bear? Have you ever tried to like cultivate grass or like grow a tree or something? <laughs> it takes some work. Okay. You have to put your God-given faith into that. By liter and you can actually read, we're not going to do it now, but if you want to go to the Old Testament, you can read the entire thing of how tithing is actually supposed to be done. It's lifting it up over your head and worshiping God with it. You ever see somebody with a tithe check over their head, praying over it? Yeah, that's because it's actually how it's done. Pray over it. Your faith is what's going to cause the seed to grow. It's not that you're putting money into a basket and it will grow automatically, which is why a lot of people don't get any harvest. They're not doing it right. There's an actual system. There's a law of seed time and harvest. If you obey that law, you're going to get a harvest. If you disobey that law, well, if you disobey the law of gravity uh, and you jump off a building, what's going to happen? You're going to fall and you're going to die. Let me ask you something. Is that... God made the law of gravity, right? He made all the physical laws we, that we operate in. If you jump off a building and die... Is that God's fault or yours? It's yours. Why? You misappropriated the law of gravity. And it worked against you. And when you hit the ground, you found out very quickly that the electromagnetic force that holds the atoms and the cement together are stronger than the law of gravity. Because you stopped at the cement. You didn't keep going into the center of the earth. The law of gravity is actually the weakest of the four forces in physics. There's a strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, electromagnetic force, and gravity. Strong nuclear force is what's actually holding those atoms together. When you split an atom and it's a big bomb going off, that radioactivity going out that kills everybody and everything, that's a weak nuclear force. It's not nearly as strong as a strong nuclear force. Okay? But it's strong enough to kill you and everybody else within 100 miles of a bomb going off. A hydrogen bomb or atomic bomb, okay? And then electromagnetic force, that's what's holding the whole... Well, I don't want to go into a whole physics lecture here. But anyway, here's the deal. That force that holds the atoms of the cement together is stronger than the force of gravity, which is why your body's going to be splattered on the sidewalk, okay? So don't do that. <laughs> don't misappropriate gravity, okay? Don't misappropriate the law of seed time and harvest either. Whether it's good seed or bad, it's going to grow. And the revelation I got is a bad seed, anything from sin, sickness, disease, poverty, death, it tends to stick a lot tougher. Doesn't need as much ground, doesn't need as much watering, doesn't need as much of your help. It'll grow on its own. And in fact, if you don't forcibly remove it, it will grow and cover everything in your yard if you let it. And it'll choke what? What does Jesus say? Yeah, it'll choke the good stuff. It'll choke the good stuff. It'll choke the word out. Okay. So, actual brass tack stuff. Okay? Tithe is the Lord's. If you give it, he will multiply it back to you. He's a man of his word. He's not a liar. You got to get this in your mind. It's God saying this. I didn't come up with this. Again, I wish there was the gospel according to Sean. It would have been awesome. And I'd have probably written a whole bunch of stuff that they didn't even cover. You know, there's a verse in here that says if everything Jesus said were written in books, it would cover all the volumes of all the books in the world. Yeah, that's in the Gospels. Guess what? There were a lot of books back then, too. They could write. This is only 2,000 years ago. It's not 20,000 years ago. This is 2,000 years ago. They had books. They wrote. There was a Greek language. There was a Hebrew language. The entire Hebrew Bible had already been written. It had been completed 400 years earlier. I don't know if you've looked at the Old Testament. It's not a small document. 
in and of itself, even with my small typeface, you know, 900 pages, maybe a thousand. And like the, they we're talking like four point font. It's tiny. Okay. They were writing, there were books and his own in the gospels itself. They're saying that if you took everything he said, it would fill all the books. I guess they didn't have the time or inclination. We got the tip of the iceberg, but we got the important tip. Okay. The rest you got to get by revelation and digging into the word and reading between the lines. Okay. That's up to us. All right. Okay. Uh, we are coming up on an hour. I got through the intro. I'm very proud of myself. I was able to get through the introduction. <laughs> I only have, oh my God. I, well, I'm looking at my, my, my paperwork. I didn't even get to my keys. Well, we got a good solid foundation. When we start next week, we're going to start with some big ones. Um, we're going to start why, uh, why people are destroyed, why they perish. I'll give you a hint. It's Hosea 4, 6. My people perish. They are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Guys, if you don't have enough knowledge on God's system of economics, you are going to really, really struggle. Because the enemy doesn't want you getting wealthy. What happens when a Christian gets wealthy and starts giving more to the gospel? Gives more to the gospel. Yeah, it gives more to the gospel. And then like what? They were in here last Sunday. You got Ike and his wife. They're going out. They're missionaries. They're saving kids in Thailand. That's what happens when good people have money. The gospel gets preached and good things happen. What happens when the bad guy has money? Bad things happen. <laughs> bad guys do bad things with money. Money's not bad. Money's just a tool. It's a hammer. You can build a house with a hammer. You've done it, Jimmy, quite a bit. You could also kill somebody with a hammer. That would be a misappropriation of that tool, right? That would be using the tool for the thing you shouldn't be doing it or using it for, but it can be used either way, okay? How you use the hammer is up to you. The skill that you use it with is up to you. You have to learn, right? If I told you right now today, I'm going to give you a hammer, I'm going to give you nails, I'm going to give you some wood, I'm going to give you stuff you can mix for cement. Jimmy and his buddies might know how to actually build a house out of that. You might not. I could give you the same materials as him and he might be able to build the house just fine. It'll last a hundred years and I give it to you and it never gets past the foundation because you don't know how to mix cement and you don't know how long cement takes to cure and you don't know how to take the wood and actually frame a house correctly with the right angles so the, so the roof tresses are strong enough to take a hundred pound snow load. If you don't know how to do that, you're not the right person to build a house. You're not going to be able to do it. Okay? That's what we're doing here. We are getting tools so that you can build. Okay? Before we're done next week, and I will go a little faster. We had to do a little, we had to do some groundwork here. We will have keys and guidelines next week on how to actually do this, how to take what you have, the seed, it's in your hand right now, how to sow it, how to cultivate it, how to protect it from the enemy so that you get a hundredfold return. Okay. I'm going to tell you one quick testimony and then we're going to be done because otherwise my wife's going to yell at me for going over yeah. too late. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> I've worn her down. She just shrugged. She was just like, eh. <laughs> it, it took two decades, but I've worn her down now. Now she doesn't mind when I go over. See, it's the war of attrition in marriage. You just keep at it. All right. So, um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Well, there's a little truth in that, but I'm just kidding. Um, okay. So, uh, I've been working on a film project for a long time. I recently got from an investor. Let me back up. When you make an offer, to movie stars and this type of stuff, you have to show proof of funds. You have to show you have the money. Otherwise, they're like, don't even bother coming to the table. You don't have any proof that you have anything. Go away. <laughs> or they just, really, the truth is they just don't return your call. Okay? So, a few months ago, after much work, I got proof of funds from an investor. And I gotta be honest, guys, I've never seen so much money in my entire life. It was 50 million euro in one account. 50 million euro is about $61 million. I have never seen that much money in my life in one place. It, although I gotta tell you, it's pretty. I gotta tell you, it's very, very pretty. All those zeros, it makes for pretty. Um, and then I got, a, the, what led to that was another investor who gave me a proof of funds for 8 million towards a film project. 
Okay, so it started small, and then once the bigger guy saw that somebody else had already put in funds and proof of funds and was interested in backing it, he put in his. So what does that allow me to do? It allows me to make offers to stars that then will trigger the rest of the funding. Now, I can't access the funds yet. I'm not going to lie to you. I can't. If I could, I probably wouldn't be here. I'd be making the film right now. <laughs> but it allows me to make legitimate multi-million dollar offers to people that when they say yes, the rest of the funds get triggered and they get released. And then I get paid and everybody gets paid and you make a film. Okay, do you guys understand? So that those breakthroughs happen directly after sowing seed. I sowed seed for those specific breakthroughs, both financial seed, spiritual seed, time, money, energy in prayer. That's where it started. Remember I said at the very beginning, every Christian failure is a what? Prayer failure. Remember we started with that at the very beginning? Okay, I hope you wrote that down. If you didn't, write it down. That's where it started. And I'm seeing God bringing in favor, which it takes. This takes favor. Um, and working things together that I couldn't do on my own. I would not have the ability to do this on my own financial strength. Um, I would not have the ability to do this just on my own connections that I've created through working in entertainment. I just wouldn't, but I'm seeing God do that. And it is a direct result of standing on these scriptures and sowing and reaping. Okay. So next week, guys, we are going to really focus on the brass tacks of how to sow, how to protect your harvest, how to force your harvest to grow. You know, if you talk to farmers, they're like, you, you can make a crop grow. There's different types of fertilizer you can put in it. If you protect it right and you sow it in good ground and you protect it and you do specific things, it's going to grow. Just talk to any farmer who regularly cultivates. He's like, no, that's going to be a good harvest. I sow good seed and good ground. I know how to protect the harvest. I know how to water it. I have the means to do it. It's going to be a good harvest. You might not be a farmer and understand and be like, well, why are you so confident? It's going to be a great harvest. Cause I do this. <laughs> He'll just look at you. Ever talk to a farmer like they'd be like, I do this for a living. I know how to make stuff grow. <laughs> okay. It's going to grow. And it's not that they're being cocky. They just do it. That's what they do for a living. Okay. This is no different. And I have seen the results over and over and over and over. And we're going to get into the scripture that it's, it's a whosoever. Jesus said, Who, whosoever prays, right? Whosoever believes he receives, what he prays for, he shall have what he asks for. Okay, we're going to get into that next week. Next week's going to be really brass tacks, going to be a little bit more hands-on. We did a lot of the theory and the outline and the foundation tonight. Next week, we're going to get hands-on on how to actually do it and get the results. Is that okay? Everybody all right with that? <laughs> yes. Haggai 1, verses 6 through 7. Thank you. Thank you. My assistant in the back got my back. I thought it was, I couldn't remember if it was Habakkuk or Haggai. I didn't want to say. Yeah. That's a good one though, right? So yeah, if you are sowing much and reaping little, consider your ways. We will talk about that. Um, that is a really, really, that's a good, good scripture. All right. Does anybody have any questions before we go tonight? Anybody have one? Yeah. Yes, in the back. Oh, well, hold on, hold on. If we're going to do prayer, we're going to break up into groups, right? Don't we normally break up into groups after? I'll tell you what. If any, okay. So normally break into into um, groups of it's usually about five, right? Okay. So why don't you grab the people that are closest to you right now? Just the few people that are closest. doesn't have to be long. If you don't want to stay, you don't have to. If you can't stay, you don't have to. Nobody's forcing anybody to pray. But grab a few people who are close to you. Three, four, or five people. Is that a good idea, Daniel? Like, you know, do you want, okay, maybe you can lead the ones back there. Do you have to go? Okay. All right. Okay. So if, if you can stay. All right. Father God, uh, we thank you for this time. We praise you. We worship you. And we honor you. Lord, we pray that the word that was sown tonight would go deep into our hearts. We pray that we would be good ground. We pray that we would receive your word and that it would be multiplied through our thoughts, words, actions, and deeds. Lord, help us to take your word 
and appropriate it, use it, put it into our lives, and not be a hearer of the word only, but to be doers of the word. We thank you, we praise you, we honor you, and we love you, Lord. Help us to be examples of your word and your will everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.